welcome you all, first of all, for coming along uh, this evening. And I suppose the, the very real threat of uh, climate change, the, the real challenge we face, was perhaps put in its starkest form uh, yet by Sir David Attenborough um, at that UN climate change summit in Poland um, last December, when he warned that the collapse of civilization and the natural world was facing us if we don't do something. He said, we're facing a man-made disaster of global scale, our greatest threat in thousands of years. If you fast forward then, what, three months later, and you had that incredible sight of uh, thousands of our secondary school students uh, on the streets of our country protesting at the lack of action on climate change, uh, urging our government to do more. Indeed, there were, uh, I believe, 37 rallies uh, in the country on that particular day, including a very well-attended one here in Sligo. Um, so we have the experienced and maybe the not so experienced, the younger, uh, calling out for action, um, sounding the warning shots. So I suppose one of the questions we want to address this evening is whether those warning shots are being heeded or not. Um, we're here this evening to discuss and debate how the agriculture industry in this country is um, responding or not indeed to the crisis and indeed what they need to do and what needs to be done to help them. Uh, bearing in mind the importance of agriculture regionally and nationally, uh, and the fact that the agriculture industry accounts for over 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our panel here, the scene of experts. Uh, I should emphasize that this is very much uh, audience participation we would like, and we will be taking your questions uh, very, very shortly, so I'll have them ready if, if, you, if you can at all. Our panel this evening, to my uh, left, outgoing MEP Marion Harkin, uh, a former Sligo Leitrim TD and MEP for the past 15 years, uh, who announced last month that she wouldn't be seeking re-election, uh, leading to all sorts of local political consternation as to what her political future might be. It's fair to say, Martin, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Um, um, Thomas Cooney. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Cooney is chairman of the IFA's National Environment Committee and the leader of the IFA Smart Farming Programme. Uh, which aims, along with the EPA, the Environmental, Environmental Protection Agency, to improve returns in the industry uh, while reducing emissions. Uh, Dr. Pippa Hackett joins us as well. Uh, she's the Green Party spokesperson on agriculture. And interestingly, Pippa was uh, telling us that she lives on a mixed organic farm. It's not right. Um, which keeps suckler cows, sheep, hens, and horses. And she's from Mayo originally as well. Um, and Deputy Martin Kenny, Sligo Leitrim Sinn Féin, uh, deputy, the party spokesperson on agriculture, also a member of the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Agriculture, and as far as I know, he doesn't have any sheep or hens. Maybe I'm wrong. No, I have no sheep. Okay. Um, welcome to you all. Um, I should mention, to put it into context, as Donald referred to, the event being facilitated by the Institute of International and European Affairs, which is one in a series of, of regional events they, held, they hold as part of the Institute's um, Future of the EU 27 project which is supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, we'll get straight down to it. As I say, we'll be coming to the audience very shortly for questions. Uh, Marion, yourself, and you were telling me you're just literally off the plane from, is it Brussels or Strasbourg this no, week? No, I was in Dublin. Oh, you're in Dublin, okay. This morning, I you're, was um, doing some work there. You're, you're a, an MEP for the last 15 years. Have you, not just you, have the MEPs done enough, do you think, to address the climate change issue in your time, or is it now only dawning on you all, now that there's an election in the offing, just how serious the problem is? Well, I, I think the answer to that, Niall, is, is yes and no. Uh, yes, in the sense that if you look at our um, emissions reduction target, we're on track as an EU to meet those uh, reduction targets by uh, 2020, and we have all the required legislation in place now to meet them by 2030. Mm -hmm. We've also met all of our conditionalities under Kyoto, both the first and, and the second set of requirements. Um, the EU is responsible for about 10% of emissions globally. And we have uh, among the lowest per capita emissions of uh, all developed nations. We okay. have a lot of, I won't go into detail, but we have a lot of legislation around uh, transport. And finally, in February of this year, we were yeah. able to get agreement on uh, emissions for heavy goods vehicles. We yeah. already have them in place for cars, vans, all that kind of thing. Okay. But the reason, and there's, there's and you're I, talking I, from a European point of view, not from the Irish MEP's no, point I'm of view. No, I'm just talking about European. I could give you 
uh, lists and lists of legislation to underpin some of the progress we've made. However, the no bit to your yeah. question uh, comes, you spoke about David Attenborough. Well, we had uh, Gretchen Thunberg. Yeah. She addressed the uh, Environmental Committee in the Parliament. And if anybody hasn't heard her, yeah. I would suggest you listen to her. Because whether it's the way she says it um, or, or what, she will, she'll chill you. Yeah. Because she literally looked people in the eye and accused them of stealing the future yeah. of you, her I, generation. I, I remember you telling us on, on, on this issue last week that she, um, she frightened the daylights out of you, you said. She did, yeah. Because she said you did not act in time. She said you didn't look to the science for the answers because you knew you wouldn't get the answers you were looking for because you wanted to continue as you have done. Okay. And for a young girl, I mean, she's extraordinarily articulate and she's very deadpan. And mm -hmm. she says things like, is my microphone on? Can you hear me? And I mean, you think, you know, but just the way yeah. she spoke, her certainty and her accusation <coughs> that okay. we have stolen their future. All right. So we've heard a little bit about what the EU is doing. What about the Irish MEPs? Because the Irish Times were left less than uh, praiseworthy of you, not just you, but of the Irish MEPs in general, saying that um, you were um, ak akin Laggards. to showing shocking apathy towards lack of, you know, in, in your addressing the, the, the climate change issue. You, well, you, you don't accept that. Well, and in fact, apparently it's the Sinn Féin MEPs who are making hay on yeah, this. Yeah, well, I, I sent a letter to the Irish Times responding to it um, because Climate Action Network, our group, and they've done an assessment of this. I think, to be fair, it's incomplete somewhat, mm. but it, it did say that the three independent MEPs together had the best score, and Sinn Féin were, were just behind us on that. Some of the other parties had very low scores as far as their assessment was concerned. I'm not going to comment on the validity or otherwise of it. What okay. annoyed me was that the Irish Times never even mentioned the independence. They mentioned everybody else. In fact, the three of us had together the highest score. But as okay. I said, we don't deserve any gold stars. We're still well behind what we should be. Okay, Thomas Cooney, you're welcome. Uh, as I said at the outset, Thomas, the agriculture industry accounting for 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions, single largest contributor to Ireland's emissions. What, what are farmers and the agriculture industry doing about this? Yeah, well, to, to date, we have, um, we have over 40,000 farmers in, in the GLOSS scheme, in, in that's the Green Low Carbon Agri scheme. Um, we, have, we have over 50 farms per year partaking in the, in the Smart Farming Initiative and they are spreading yeah. the and word. And you're directly involved in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they are interacting with discussion groups and everything. So there's another thousand farmers. Those farmers in, in the Smart Farming Initiative, that, and I see Trevor Boland down there, there's one of them down in the room. There, there is, a, there is a, an initiative there to, where you can reduce your costs and reduce your inputs on the farm, save money whilst reducing your your carbon footprint okay. and improving your water uh, Is there quality. much of an uptake in that? Is there, is there interest there is, in it? Yeah, it's, 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 um, there's, it's full up for the year again and there's a, it's almost full for next year as well. So there is, there is a good, good uptake in it. Agricultural emissions have more or less remained the same as they are in 1990 and we've increased our output. Yeah, but still too high. Considerably since that. that, yes. And there is more being done and we have the Chagas Climate Roadmap, the proposals there from the Oireachtas, um, the Joint Oireachtas Committee for Climate Change recommended that, the, that all the measures in the Chagas Climate Roadmap be implemented, which has yeah. the potential to reduce agricultural emissions by, by up, to, up to a third. There's seven, yeah. seven but, million but tons. You, you said before when one of those plans uh, were unveiled that, that farming can and will do more. Mm. Is, and, and is, is it time for action? More and, action and there is worse. more, and we are calling on government to do more in the renewable energy sector. Like, for example, every farmer has sheds. We have roof space. If, if we cross the border into Northern Ireland, you see nearly every shed in, in, and, and dwelling house covered with solar panels, mm. creating mm. energy. Do you know, you have more can be done on, on the rollout of anaerobic digestion, and that is yeah. that is be, has been recommended in the Oireachtas okay. um, report as well. We also, yeah, sorry, just to um, we also the way emissions are calculated at the moment. 
we don't get any credit for our hedgerows, our grassland, our permanent grasslands. Our farming is so different to the rest of continental Europe, where it's mm. mainly an indoor system and cattle are grazing out here up to nine months of the year and our sheep and, and uh, it's, it's, it's so different but we don't get credit for that. Okay. And, and, and do you think we're, we're, we have to or we are coming to a situation where we simply have to cut back on cattle production and dairy farming? Is, is that the way forward do you think? Well we are one of the most carbon efficient places in the world to produce food. Our, our beef, our dairy farmers are, are the most carbon efficient in Europe and our beef farmers are in the top five and, and there's very little between the, the one and five, like so we're, we're there or thereabouts. If, if we cut back, there's, there's probably, there's, there's still a growing global demand. You have a growing world population. There is a growing demand for, for, for beef and dairy. And we're probably one of the best placed countries to, to maintain that and to maintain a vibrant rural economy, do you know? And like ha farming has been such a heartbeat of rural Ireland. And, yeah. and if, if we cut back and, and it's, it's not going to be good for the rural communities. Okay, uh, Pippa, I, I want to ask you about, uh, there was uproar in the farming industry over, over two uh, recent um, stories and reports. One was to do with the, the medical journal study which su suggested that our meat and dairy consumption would have to drop by 90% in future if we're to be serious about um, addressing the issue of climate change. And there was also a suggestion that more of us look, need to look at vegetarianism, veganism. Is that something you think our agriculture industry will cope with and will adopt to? Um, I think with the Eat Lancet study, I think the initial response was one of, um, I think, shock among the general public that the, the figures were so high. I think, yeah. you know, within hours of its release, then there was further in-depth analysis in terms of who had backed the study, and that caused a lot of mm. discussion too. Um, you know, when you dug through the, you know, scroll down through all the web pages, you would find names like Monsanto and Bayer and Nestle involved in this study, which would be sort of counterintuitive to most farmers, animal-based yeah. farmers. That why would you know these huge, um, you know, pharmaceutical and, and, and multinational global sectors, which seemingly support animal agriculture be supporting this particular study. So I think there was a can of worms opened. Yeah, um, but I, I was listening to, <coughs> to one commentator and they said at least it has initiated and, and begun debate on the issue. Well, and yeah. maybe the, the, what they're saying in the 90% doesn't really matter. It's the fact that people are talking about it. Yeah, I think, I think to be honest, there was nothing really new in it. I mean, we've been known for, for, I'd say, a long, long while, decades, that we probably do consume too much meat. You know, we are in a very, you know, Western civilization probably eats too much of everything, whether it's meat or sugar or fats or, or, or you know, processed foods. Um, from a, I suppose from, a, from my perspective, I would, you know, all meats aren't the same. There's, mm. there's meat that's, you know, locally produced, <clears throat> that people eat locally, that has low air miles. Then there's meat that's, you know, intensively produced, um, you know, with lots of imported feed brought in to, to, to feed the animals, to produce it in that way. So I think you sort of need to step back and see exactly how the farming, how, how it works. But if indeed there is a, a world uh, trend, you know, maybe away from, you know, red meat or beef eating and, um, and dairy um, consumption, then, you know, our government really has to, and, and, and other governments, I suppose, around the world, have to sort of think about that and see how, yeah. you know, how, is, how are their own, how is our country going to adapt yeah. to a changing, you know, food consumption? Your, your party has been critical of what they would see as lack of action by the farming organisations and support. Would that still be the case? Would you still feel they have a lot more to do? Um, oh, I think so, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, the emissions are still going up. I mm. mean, Marion alluded to the EU as a, as a, as a, as a continent or as a, as a group of 28 countries has the lowest per capita um, emission, um, emissions. Ireland in the EU has one of the highest per capita emissions. So when we look at Ireland as its own country, we have an awful lot to do. And agriculture has to play its role. I know we've got transport and we've got energy sectors. We can't, you know, we all, every single sector has to play its role and agriculture <coughs> has to play its role. And unfortunately, the emissions from Irish agriculture, excuse me, <coughs> are increasing. And, you know, we can talk about efficiencies, you know, and, um, you know, using technology to, to improve efficiencies and using breeds to improve efficiencies. But efficiencies really only work if the numbers stay the same. 
but you can't have efficiency and increase numbers. That just doesn't work. It's a bit like, you know, I don't know, Ryanair having wonderfully efficient planes, but doubling the numbers in the sky. The emissions keep rising. So I think we have to look at that okay. in terms of Irish agriculture. Okay, uh, Martin, as I said, you're a member of the Joint Directors Committee on Agriculture. Now, far be it from any politician to be proposing new taxes of any sort, um, but it seems that the introduction of a carbon tax, which the committee has discussed and considered, would be one way of getting <coughs> us to step into line in relation to our commitment to reducing emissions. Is that something you would support? Or well, not. no. Well, first of all, it's not the introduction of a carbon tax. It's already there. Yeah, yeah. but it the, came the, in the, the level it came in 10 of years ago, and mm. it was set at, I think, it's uh, 20, 20 euro per ton. Yeah. 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 And the proposal yeah. is to bring it up to 80 up euro to 80. Is that something you would support? Did no, you support it at the committee? Or? No, we wouldn't support it, and we didn't support it at the committee. And the reason we didn't support it was um, basically we find that carbon taxes don't work. Well, why don't because they work? They don't work because, first of all, and I'll give you the example. A lot of people working here in Sligo Town live in Kinlaw or live in Tubbercurry. And a couple of years ago, the price of petrol or fuel was probably 20, 30% less than it is now. Are the people stopped driving to Sligo Town to work? Of course they haven't. They have no other option. In what we need to do is put alternatives in place first, and then you can look at how you can tax the things that are uh, high carbon. But doing that in the absence of alternatives is, is, is just putting the cart before the horse. Yeah. And, it, and, and, it won't, and, and what, it won't what work. alternatives are you talking about? Because I, I know, um, McCarthy mentioned this uh, during the week as well. Y are you talking about government investment? You're talking about government investment. You're talking about, for instance, uh, since the carbon tax came in that we have now, I think just 3.3 billion euros have been collected by the Irish government in carbon tax. None of that has been ring-fenced no. for using it for climate uh, or, or anything. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just gone into the general exchequer yeah. and it's used for whatever it's been used for. The first thing the government need to do is they need to become responsible at their behaviour before they start lecturing to ordinary people out there who are working very hard, who can't afford to pay additional taxes in regard to their fuel or in regard to insulate their house. Like I, I met people today in Ballyshannon living in rented houses that, and they can't get a house that is well insulated and all winter they're telling me that they're paying huge costs for to reheat that house. To say that you're going to do something for the environment by putting an additional tax on those people who are already at the pin of their collar to exist is, okay. is just ridiculous. So, so it's and I think, I think it's, it's, it's really one of these things that we come about that government wants to say, look, this is the, the solution. Everybody has to pay a little. You know, the truth is, the big players here have to pay a little. We okay. have, to have to pay the, the most because it's if the polluter pays principle is going to be endorsed, it has to be the producer of the pollution, not the unfortunate consumer out there who have no other alternative. Okay, and, and be, before we move on to another question, uh, uh, the, the Joint Oireachtas uh, report and recommendations, th there is a, an acknowledgement that the farming industry needs to be helped. Yes. You're not there to punish them or to, to blame oh, no, them. And I think one of the things that, that I, I get out of this whole debate is that there's huge opportunity for farmers here. There's huge opportunity for agriculture. Land use and how we, how we change and how we evolve in the future in regard to all of this could be something that could be very, very good for farmers, particularly on what we call marginal land or poor land in the west of Ireland, where farmers yeah. are already you know, finding it difficult to survive on the model of farming that they're using at present. That if we can develop alternative models to do that, then we can move forward. We had a number of, of recommendations that we put out in our alternative report uh, in regard to, I suppose, what we call lower intensity and higher nature value farming. And we talked about, you know, uh, the whole slurry issue, how we need to deal with that, how we need to get our, nutri our, our nutrients for soil nutrition in a different way, and we need to use less of the, the bag stuff, as we used to call it, for many farmers that have been in the room. In other words, the artificial fertilizer and the artificial nitrates. And we need to move away from that. We need to enhance our hedgerows. At the moment, we're given grants for farmers for to plant land. And at the same time, if you look at the farmers that have hedgerows around the country, they have them cut like little box hedges. And the reason for that is because they're fined by the yeah. Irish government under their single payments if they let the hedge grow out. Somebody takes a photograph from outer space and say, oh, you can't claim on that, and you're pe penalised for it. They should okay. be absolutely allowed to let the hedgerows grow okay. out and so that we can have a higher na nature value farm. And that's okay. what we need to go uh, into the future. We refer to the Lancet report, Eric. Can I ask you as a panel to react to the, the, the controversy over the recent Antoshka Schools Initiative. The farmers in particular, as you know, Thomas, went absolutely berserk over this. Um, the Green Schools Resource Pact introduced to certain uh, schools advising students to cut down on their, their meat intake and to lower their carbon footprint, and they were talking about the introduction of Meatless Mondays. Was it an overreaction on your association's behalf or not, Thomas? 
No, I wouldn't think so because um, there were so many other other options that they could have used. You know, we could have went for a sugarless Monday. We could have went for a, a, a processed, food-free Monday. Do you know, like rather than well, than, maybe than, they're than, doing than, that as than well. I don't rather know than a meat-free Monday. I don't think they are. Do you know, like we could go for a, a, a chips and pizza-free Monday. Do you know, or something like that instead, a junk food-free day. Um, we we felt that Antashka weren't really qualified to give dietary advice, and and it was it went against everything that. People like Dr. Eva Orsmond and, and all that said that, that veganism, do you know, it's, it's look, at, I'm, everybody's entitled to be a vegetarian if they want, but it's not something that could be forcing upon people to, to do. We'd be of the opinion a little, a balanced diet of, of, yeah. of everything is, is best. That's but, 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 I mean, you, you know, you had representatives from the farming industry saying that this was anti dairy, anti livestock. One person accused Antashka of ignoring the values of rural life. Do you yeah, well, think that was an overreaction? Well, if you look at transport emissions, transport emissions have cre increased by 133% since, since 1990. Agricultural emissions have gone up by 3% mm. since 1990, or 3% lower, actually. They were, they were even, even lower. There's nobody saying to go for a careless Monday. You know, uh, because we can't. Okay. You know, well, there's not nobody saying to, to stop Pippa, playing this. Pippa, did so you think it was a, a worthy initiative? It wasn't in all schools, as we know, yeah. and it was backed by the Minister for Education, we should say as well. Look, I, I think it was. I, I think it was an overreaction, to be honest. I mean. I, again, as I say, I mean, we've been trying to encourage sort of healthy eating in all sorts of guises, and one of them is we do eat too much meat, and I'm not, that, that's not necessarily saying, oh, let's shut down agriculture in Ireland. It's about, as I said, the quality of the meat we eat. So, I mean, you know, when my, my parents' generation, they had like one chicken a year, and that was like a special day. You know, now people are eating meat three and four times a day, you know, and it, it, it's too much meat, mm. you know? So I think because it's so cheap now, we're producing cheap meat. And, uh, you know, a colleague of mine, actually, in a, he's an agricultural economist, also has described our model of beef, beef production in particular as burgers and meatball model. So like the BAM model, you know, because I think, I think that's fairly accurate because we're just pumping out beef out of Ireland, we're pumping out milk, and there's no real, you know, it's nothing really differentiating Irish beef from, from other beef, unfortunately. Okay. And I think well, that's, that's okay, sort Mar of Mary, well you, you're a address. former teacher, as we know. You, you think it was something which was relevant well, just and... There, there are one or two things that differentiate Irish beef. I mean, beef produced in temperate clim climates... Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Um, you know, grassland has the lowest uh, carbon emissions globally, and Ireland is one of the best. I don't have the ex I'm not saying that there are no issues, but I'm saying that beef produced in Ireland is not necessarily the same as beef produced elsewhere, and I think that needs to be taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. That's not negating your argument, but it's an important part of it. And I mean, if we look, for example, to Brazil at the moment, um, uh, they're again, I mean, I suppose they never stopped cutting down the forests, but they're in, it's an increase in that at the moment. And very often the rate of increase of deforestation in Brazil is linked to the price of beef globally. And so I think we have to look at food security. It's, it's, it's all part of a bigger picture. So the beef that we produce, the milk that we produce, we have to produce it in the most efficient way. Yes, we have to recognize that there are issues around how much we produce, how it's produced, how efficient it is, but equally, it would be wrong to say that beef produced in Ireland is the same as elsewhere. Okay. Well, I, I, well, I, I would just like to qualify okay. that a little and bit we'll more in terms in. of, um, I was perhaps a little rash in my description of it, but when you look at the, the market price, that, yep. that as I, I'm a beef farmer, fair enough, I'm an organic, but it's still pretty much li linked in line yep. to the conventional price. You know, 375 per kilogram or 370, wherever it is today, is that's where beef is for the Irish farmer. So okay. that's, you compare that across the board. It's, well, you know, Europe, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, okay. You know, well, so well, it's well, not, you know, market value, it's not perceived yeah. as any yeah, better. Okay. No, so well, that's Mark, really just what I was yeah. Thomas from. was saying that, you know, and, and Chagas can't, can't have a responsibility or they can't be an authority on, on, on dietary and, and, yeah. and, 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 and food requirements. But I mean, they, they are tasked with protecting the environment. Was it relevant, do you think, that they? 
uh, introduce you know, this I or think, not? I think it, it, was, it, it was partially relevant, possibly. You know, look, it, it opened up a discussion. Maybe that was no harm. But I, I think that um, the point that both, both Marion and Pippa made, in fairness, both of them are correct. I, I think one of the problems we have with Ireland is we produce beef of the highest quality. Like, I've been to Europe and I've been presented with steaks that are supposed to be the best steak in the restaurant, and it was half grizzled. If you got it here in a butcher, you send it back. But yet, yeah. we don't get the price in Ireland for the quality of product that we produce. We're family farm, grass-fed, free-roaming, fully traceable, hormone-free, yeah. all of those things, mm -hmm. and yet we get an average price the same as everywhere else in Europe. Now, that is a problem, and the problem here is the supermarkets, and the processors. They are not interested in differentiating the Irish product to get the highest possible price for it and delivering that price back to the primary producer. Okay. And until we get to a stage where we have some control over that, and unfortunately the control is left in the market system. And the market system doesn't work for the small farmer in the west of Ireland who's okay. bringing their wayland to the market and trying to get a price yeah, for them. Yeah, yeah. And Thomas, what we need, we need, we need to, to change that model okay, and get I, a model where if we're producing the highest quality product, at a low intensity farming that's doing the, the least damage to the environment, we, the farmers should be getting a premium okay. for it. And if okay. they do that, and we were getting premium for it, I'll guarantee you, farmers would then, without anyone telling them to, yes. reduce. Okay, because Pippa, they Pippa made a point, I want to go back. Thomas, you wanted to make a comment on, on yeah, that? Yeah, uh, just to follow up on what Martin was saying, look, I agree, we're not getting enough for our product for the standards that we're producing it to. And, and look, at the, there has been unfair trading practice legislation brought in in the Parliament. It probably does need to be strengthened, I suppose. Yeah. It, we welcome it. It's a start, what it is, but it's not enough. Below cost selling. If you walk into every supermarket uh, here, you see meat is the one thing that's used uh, as, as a thing to lure people in. 50% discount. You see discounted steaks, discounted chickens, discounted pork. Meat is used to lure people into the supermarkets. and below cost selling does yeah. need to be stamped out well, and the re there needs to be a retail regulator okay. put in. Incidentally, I, there's only something like 1% of organic farmers in Ireland. But it's about just under about 1.7 or why, so. Why is it so low, Pippa, do you think? Um, because Mostly. government policy has actively starved that sector of funding. Yeah, yeah. It's, been, it's been starved of funding. I mean, if you actually, if you just look at it in, as its own sector, it's one of the most flourishing sectors worldwide. You mm. know, it's, it, it's, it, you, the, the consumers who, who like buy organic food are, are you know, they're, they're wealthy, they're, they're, they're environmentally aware, they're, yeah. they're you know, aware of how their food is produced, and they will pay for that. And, and they will pay the extra, yes. they're happy and to so do that. So here's this market in this okay. world of ours that, that our country has decided, well, we're not going to enter that market. Okay. Yeah, we're much lower than the, the, Euro oh, Sorry, the Euro Euro European average, average is about yes. 7%. Yes. You've countries like and, Austria and are up around 23%. Well, is there opportunities there, Thomas, then, do you think, for, uh, possibly, for more organic possibly Maybe the size, maybe the size of farms in Ireland is is part of the reason why it's not. The average size is 32 hectares. That'd be perfect. You know? It may not be big enough to, to deliver a full-time viable income. If you have to go dairy, and it's it's harder to go. You need a bigger farm to go dairy. It may be. Being starved of funding is, is another reason as well. Yeah. Yeah. The, market, the, market. the market into the product is a big problem mm. as well. I mean, 70% of the vegetables, organic vegetables in Ireland, are imported, and uh, we're importing carrots. Yeah. from other countries that we can grow mm -hmm. in Ireland organically, and yet we're importing them. And yet, the people out there who are selling them can't get enough people to grow the yeah. product. The organic farmers that I've been around the country and talked to who are in the horticultural sector are making quite good money. You know, very few sell them when you go to a farmer and they're not complaining, and they're not <laughs> to be, but usually farmers have a lot of complaints. When you go yeah. to the organic vegetable farmers, you know, they're saying, ah, oh, yeah, things are pretty good, we're, we're mm -hmm. happy, we're okay. So that tells me that there's an opportunity there for people, and it's not been taken up, and one of the main reasons it's not been taken up is because the sector hasn't been organised properly, it hasn't been, yeah. been, been worked out in a way in which we can, we can market the product, that we get. and any sector in agriculture that you want to uh, establish, really you have to have it done by an arm of the state. You have to get somebody from government to come and organise it and set up the sector, remove the risk initially for farmers so That's that they right. can get going and they can get working, and okay. then they will take over. Because uh, it's left to market right, okay. forces, what happens then is some big guy comes in I and undercuts the small I'll, 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 co I'll come to the audience in, in a couple of moments. We, we are, as we know, facing quite hefty fines if we don't, as a country, if we don't meet our, our 2020 emissions targets. Um, isn't there a sense, Marion, that people think, well, it's, it's a problem for the future, it doesn't affect the here and now? and there's no urgency. Yes, I think that is the case. I think if you go back to what Greta Thunberg said, she said, you don't listen to the science because it'll give you answers 
that you do not want to hear. And to be honest, as an MEP who flew over and back to Brussels every week, at times I thought, how can I be telling other people about, you know, reducing CO2 emissions when I'm probably contributing um, just as much and more than others. So I think it's that we all actually have to look to ourselves. But of course, the state has to put yeah. in place the framework that we can act within. But just seeing that we are talking about agriculture here today, there is just one point I'd like to make, and I'm sure we will discuss it. The, the new CAP proposal yeah. gives a great deal of flexibility to member states as to how they draw up their CAP strategic plan. And I agree with Martin, there is a real opportunity now, within the next two years, yeah. um, for environmentalists, farmers and others to come together to see how that sector can contribute to mitigating climate change, how it can lower emissions, and how it can still yeah. deliver so viable will, incomes. Will you be for pushing for that then? That it, should, it should be part of the, the, the CAP negotiations, the CAP funding. Absolutely. I mean, the Parliament won 20% of the single farm payment for eco schemes and 30% of rural development for eco schemes. But member states, for the first time ever, will have huge flexibility in how they design those schemes so okay. that they can look to their own needs, look to different parts of the country, what works one place, etc. Okay. And to, to then, uh, if you like, work together to, uh, to try to find ways of, of as I okay. said, lowering the emissions. All right. and, and that's a real opportunity, and we need to grab it. And I, I'm going to yeah. be straight up on what I'm saying here. The farming organisations need to step up to the table and to represent their farmers, because if their farmers aren't sustainable, their farmers have to be sustainable because you're talking about Irish beef and milk and prime produce, and it is. But if it's not sustainably priced in five years' time, we won't even get the average European price because that's what's going to matter. So this isn't about for or against farmers. This is about ensuring we have a sustainable okay. agriculture industry, which I would fully support. And I think we all have to step up to that mark. Okay. Would, would you agree with that or not, Thomas? And, 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 no, I, and I, I, I'm I, conscious I, of what, what Marion said about um, uh, her own carbon footprint flying back and forward to, to Brussels uh, every week. We had our own Taoiseach saying that he was uh, worried about his own carbon footprint. He was eating less meat. And there was uproar about that as well amongst the farming Yeah, community. well, look, at it. we had a number of suggestions we put the government in a climate activation um, fund to invest money now in farms that will reduce our fines down the road, invest in renewables. We have the whole, as I said earlier on, solar, there's the whole biomass sector can be, as Martin referred to, yeah. marginal land that could be growing something else, maybe some kind of energy crops instead of, we have the whole peat and coal born and plants, you know, that, that can be changed to, yeah. to biomass all that sort of area. There, if the investment can be made now, of course I agree with Marion, we have called in our CAP programme for the next, the next agri-environmental scheme to be 10,000 per farm, the same as, as what the old reps type scheme was, and, and it will be all measures in it aimed at reducing emissions, improving water quality, maybe, maybe possibly renewables in, in it as well, but, but the renewables sector sh should come at some, okay. it should come, whether, whether it's CAP funding, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll Whether I'll it's come, CAP I'll funding or moment. national funding, it, it doesn't matter. We are all for it. We want renewables. We are on the... Of course we want renewables because it's an opportunity for farmers to make more money. Okay. That's the... That's the that's well, the, at, least, at least you're honest about it anyway, Thomas. The, uh, Mar um, Martin, have you, have you, what are you doing well, to I, reduce I, your I, carbon footprint? Oh. <laughs> well, I, I actually... I actually oh, Hold on, no, Leslie, so, I'll, Leslie, I'll, so I'll, are come, you Leslie. I'll come but <laughs> Leslie, I'll come to you. I'll come, I'll come to you. Easy to... I, Easy, easy no, there's an no election campaign no in election so, um, uh, Yeah, well, look, I mean, the, 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 it's interesting. This year, I actually looked at it. For the second time, I looked at an electric car. And, um, did you? I did, yeah. Uh, and because I'm a long way from the doll, I looked to see would the, would the miles work. And, and did you just look at one, it or did you buy it? One, I had it for a weekend. They gave it to me for a weekend, and I looked at it. And okay. It would work from the point of view of distance, just about. You ran it dry. So it'd, be hard, it'd be hard to get to Leitrim and back in an electric car. Oh, no, no problem. 400, 400 miles. Kilometers, it, yeah. 400 kilometres. Oh, it says yeah. 450, 400, really. Um, the problem is it, it's nearly 40 grand. 
Okay. And it's, it's even like, I have a decent salary, but I have a mortgage and I have 14 aged children, two of them go to college, and I, I couldn't afford to pay that now. And that type of thing will, will have to be looked at some scheme for to, for to get people that they're able to move to electric vehicles, because I really, the reality is for most people out there, electric vehicles won't be an option for them until there's second hand ones available. Because yeah. most people, it's a second hand car they buy, not a new mm. one, because they can't afford it. So, yeah. you know, we, we, are, we, are, we are a distance from that. But just to come back to the, the points that were made about agriculture, Hold on. they are a bit, yeah, well, they're not available on the mileage that will work for people rural in rural Ireland, because the only the new ones that come out now are available for that mileage. So, anyway, the, the, the issue in regard to agriculture and, and sectors and, and where things is going and the beef sector and all of that, what I'm fearful is that the push toward intensity and intensity. You have to have more and more cattle in order to survive. Just you have to more and more land. Mm -hmm. You have to be bigger and bigger and bigger. The farmer that had, you know, was milking 30 cows a few years ago yeah. was able to survive. Now they have to have 80 cows to make the same income. And that's the problem we've got. That okay. and all the time, the pressure is for to produce more for a lower profit. And therefore, and the that's pressure a re is that's a to get bigger problem. and bigger. And that's, that's part yeah. of the problem. And we need to tackle okay. that problem. All right. Does anybody from the audience uh, want to ask a question? Leslie, I'll, I'll take you first and then the lady behind you. This is Leslie O'Hara, who's a Green Party, uh, Green Party local election candidate, former general election candidate. Leslie. Hi, uh, yeah, Leslie O'Hara, candidate in, uh, in Carrigan Shannon and South Leitrim for uh, Green Party. If, I think if Greta Thornburg was here tonight, she'd probably send the two gentlemen out of the class and have them stand, you know, with Dunce's cap or whatever. Because, mm -hmm. you know, one thought about the, be the, the meat situation, Pat O'Neill, CEO of Avonmore, 20 years ago, said we should only be eating red meat once a week. And, you know, the gentleman is standing up there or sitting there from the I IFA talking about, you know, maybe we should probably kind of do something, maybe. And if I look at this incredible 29-page document, which he sent out, which is your manifesto to, for the local elections and, and the uh, European elections, there's a tiny bit in there about environment, and there's nothing about solar, and there's nothing about wind, and yet every week I'm contacted by sheep farmers and the like wanting to get into it. You just are not at the races. You're just not at the races. Okay. The lady behind you, do you want to make a comment or ask a question? Thank you very much. My name is Bridget Murphy, and before I make my comment, I would just like to say to, to Thomas that your statistic about the dairy being the most efficient in, in Europe and the beef being the fifth most efficient um, that those are 2015 research based on 2011 statistics. So I think somewhere along the line, the IFA needs to revisit those. But I'd like to speak about the fact that women make up 13% of, of farm owners in Ireland, and we make up 50% of the rural population. And undoubtedly, we're the backbone of the family farm. But You'd also see us out at the front campaigning for the environmental biodiversity and climate action issues. Although women are plentiful in the farming organizations, we run their offices, we the secretaries and PROs, and more recently we branch and chair um, uh, county chairs. But we and our issues and our contributions to climate action are notably absent from the policy and decision-making tables. In 2019, Men are still speaking for us women. There's nothing in the old or the new CAP proposals for women. And although we hear about a concerted effort to bring women and young farmers along, um, you would notice that this is not happening. Okay. We would see, say, for example, uh, Phil Hogan in the last week has announced a 1 billion euro for loans to young farmers with preferential rates and longer payback terms. But there was no similar scheme for women. So farming organizations need to bring women up to the climate okay. change and agricultural tables. All right, okay. I just want to make one more statement Yeah, very here. quickly, because I, wa I want to get Thomas to uh, Mary to Robinson says that climate change is a man-made problem that needs a feminist solution. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Thomas, there's a couple of questions uh, there. You, do, you want to, do you want to answer Bridget, first of all? Yeah, I can answer Bridget on, on the women. Um, a couple of years ago, we only had one woman at National Council. There's 58 people sit at National Council. There is, out of, the, out of the 29 county chairs, and there's, there's a couple of the bigger counties broken up, we have eight out of 29 is women. And a couple of years ago, there was only one. So we are doing a lot. We have had a diversity committee set up, and there has been a number of recommendations 
uh, on that, and, and Kathleen has been involved in that. Kathleen can comment on that later on if she wants. Yeah. Um, she's one of, one of them, the, the eight women. Um, the one billion loans, there's nothing, any, any woman farmer out there, that female farmer that, that meets the criteria that has done, that, that fits, that has the agricultural qualifications and in the age bracket for it, there's nothing to stop a man or woman from lifting that money. Yeah. And, and the if, point if, then the, if they're farming, they, they can get it. So the, the point that Leslie made is you're only playing lip service to this uh, Lip service because... This issue. And Marion and said... Forty per, up to 40% of the, of, the of the next cap has to be environmental measures. And that is all in that document there. Because at the minute, you have 30% greening, you have, the, you have the loss schemes, you have the knowledge transfer, you have the, the beef genomic scheme. All those schemes are lowering your, the carbon footprint of those farms. You have the traditional hay meadows, you have the fencing off of water courses. The beef genomic scheme is, is delivering a more efficient suckler cow. Okay. That they can feed the calf with, with less supplements, you know, and, and better fertility, all that sort of thing. So we, we are doing a lot. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'll let you back in a moment. Just, just before I, I come, to, I want to come to, to Kathleen in the front row. Pippa, just on that, seeing as Leslie asked the question, he's a Green Party candidate. Because climate change is now acknowledged as being such a huge issue, why aren't you doing better politically? Greens. Why don't you have more <coughs> TDs? I think Why don't you have councillors in every local authority? Well, we should do, but people are people are people don't like change, and this is a big change for people. You know, to 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 consider changing your lifestyle. I mean, as we say, we're leaving it for our next generation. I mean, our my children are going to have a the way we're going a completely different childhood and, and adulthood to what we have had. I think yeah. we're going to have to, you know, we're, we're going to talk about, we've got a, a, a overtly consumeristic um, um, society. We, we can throw away what we like, we can buy what we want, we all want to drive big cars, we've all got like, you know, 600 pound phones in our hands. Yeah. And yet we spend, I don't know, what, 10, 11% of our, of our, of yeah. our, of our, of our, our, our just but, disposable income But is, it, is, it, is, it, is so it frustrating for you when you've been pushing this agenda for years before it was fashionable? Yeah. And and, and yeah, it, it is frustrating, but I think I, I, I would like to think that the, the Gretas of this world and, and the, the, you know, the David Attenboroughs, and, and it's so much in our faces now. You yeah. know, even 10 years or even five years ago at the time of the last local elections, European elections, it, it wasn't at okay. the, the height it is now. So, I mean, you know, we are on, on, a, on a green wave, most certainly. I'd okay. like to, you'd like to hope that Marian. we can uh, well, capitalize on that. Jump in a little You're not going to join the Green Party, you know. <laughs> I'm going to jump in. I'm going to jump in a little. I, if, a few minutes ago I said I put it up to the farming organisations. I think it also has to be put up to the Green Party in this sense. F looking at it from the outside, because uh, I'm neither a farmer nor a Green Party member, yeah. it seemed to me that for too long people are in silos yep. and that there wasn't enough honest, open conversation. I'm not blaming anybody for that, but I'm simply saying that's what happened. And the truth is, and I have been to some uh, farmers' meetings, thanks be to God I've been to them, where I finally can see that farmers and people who care about the environment are talking together and are looking at solutions. That hasn't happened in any meaningful way up to now. But now it's happening, and the truth is, it, it probably needs people like you who have a farming background, you're from rural Ireland, you understand the issues. I think up to now, to some extent, and this isn't meant as a criticism, it's just meant as how I see it, and I could be totally wrong, that mm. the, the green movement in Ireland was more urban-based and was not mm. uh, you know, conscious of the okay. issues yeah. in no, rural Ireland. Okay. Yeah. Um, Martin, did you want, you want, you want, you want no, to say it, something? No. Just, uh, yeah. just, I, I very much concur with Martin. I, I think there, there has been for too long a sense that the environmentalist lobby you know, is uh, anti-farmer mm -hmm. and that the farmer back is up as soon as yeah. they see somebody coming with a green credential. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's, there's, a, there's a happy marriage to be made here okay. if they could work yeah. it out. But right. Uh, uh, sorry, Thomas. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and just to, just to say, we do have constructive meetings with the Green Party. Oh, we do yeah, meet right, Grace okay. Sullivan. Do, yeah. Pip, Pippa came all to right. our Smart Farm okay. event last year, and so did Martin in, in All right. Uh, in, uh, in Kathleen, Kathleen Henry, well. recently uh, uh, elected chairperson of County Sligo IFA. Um, yeah, good evening, everyone. Just, I suppose, a few comments. I suppose it's, um, Bridget uh, mentioned all about women. Um, I guess I joined the IFA when her president, Colin O'Donnell, was one of our senior officers. 
Um, he's since, as you know, departed and become the president of the IMHFA. I guess at the time, I didn't care whether I was a man or a woman or whatever else. I love farming. And I guess that's the bottom end of the day. Whether you're a woman or man, and you love farming, you're going to go out and do the best for it. In relation to the environment, I'm sorry, Thomas, but I was a woman. I happened to be on the environment committee at the time we were trying to start off the smart farming. So to say that there wasn't women involved in trying to get environmental issues in the IFA, I'm sorry, but I was there, I was on the management committee, and I was one of the people that tried to get the smart farming going. I happened to be bringing those books down, and your president was... Yeah, but like, I don't mean this in a bad sense, but does that mean that because we're a woman, we should get priority? I don't know. I mm. am in the, I'm in the IFA, and I don't think I've ever got priority because I'm a woman. You just go out balance. there and you fight your issues, whatever it is. And I've just listened to everybody here going on about farming yeah. and about whatever else. Just sometimes it feels like we are green, we do our best, we have always done our best for the environment, we've always done our best to make sure that we have sustainable farming, and we've always done our best out there. But it just feels like it's always farming that's been here. What about the other industries that's contributing to the environment? I don't see you having any meetings about aviation or anything else or transport or whatever else. Sometimes it just feels like the farming is the easy target to pick on. We mightn't be perfect. We're doing our best. We have brought in smart farming initiatives. Yeah. Um, and look, I don't, I don't know. Like At the IFA, as Thomas said, I know I'm only recently elected. We are trying to bring in change. We are trying to bring in more females. And that's, I suppose, across every organization. It's okay. like it's a learning curve. The environment, we are doing our best. We are trying to bring in new measures on the environment. Okay. And that is just basically, All I right. suppose, to give somebody else a capacity. This, this gentleman here in, in the front row wants to, wants to ask questions. Well, I'll, I'll let the panel in maybe to react to what Kathleen has to say. Hi, uh, Gavin Corkin from Plan Energy. I'm an energy engineer. Um, I was just asking the panel if uh, they could outline some of the business opportunities for uh, farming and renewables and if they're aware of any barriers that need to be lifted in the short term. And if you want to take that, Thomas? Yeah, I'll, <coughs> I'll take that. Um, on solar, for example, the planning permission requirements when you cross 50 square metres, even if there's no house in, in close proximity, um, the, there's I think the, re the Renewable Energy Directive at, at European level does need to be revisited to, to make it easier for community-based projects, mm -hmm. let it be solar or anaerobic digestion or possibly, well, wind is, is a difficult one at the moment because it, it's not the most popular one to have in the area, but the other two, solar and anaerobic digestion, to, to have community-based because they're probably going to be more effective at community-based level if at farm scale, the restrictions on planning permission, grid access is, is another one that, that, that has to be looked at as well. That's okay, I think there's a number of, sorry Martin, sorry, you want I, to was, say I was just going to say that I think one of the big problems with solar is the fact that the, the, the small person that puts panels on the roof of their shed can't get paid for the energy. Yes, that's, that's, that's an immediate thing that can be solved. And in actual yeah. fact, it not only should the, the, the farmer that's prepared to put their static shed and covered in solar panels or the person that's prepared to put it in their house, they shouldn't just get the same as the big uh, company that's doing it. They should actually get more than the big company that's doing it. They should yeah. get an extra mm. because they're taking a risk that they can't afford in their lives, whereas the company that has a whole lot of investors can afford risk. So I think, you know, there should be a, an immediate thing done there and it will change it overnight. All right. Okay, well, uh, the gentleman in the second row, I think, get his hand up first and then the lady behind behind him. Sorry, yeah. So, well, my name is John Connor. I'm a member of the Institute. I'm also a farmer, and uh, I'm over 70 years of age, and I have lived on a small farm in the natural world all my life. So without being arrogant, I think I have a fair idea of what I'm talking about. And I want to go back to the issue, first of all, raised by Mr. Cooney from the IFA, that not enough credit is given to the farm, to agriculture, for the sequestration of carbon. Mm. I had only personal, but there are thousands like me. Uh, ten years ago, I designated half my farm under a scheme called FEPS, and we planted something like 65 acres and 150, 180,000 trees, mostly broadleaves, growing. I got no credit for the sequestration of carbon that that forest does, or the, or the capture. But I got a, an accusatory a uh, finger of blame pointed at me for the 20 bovines that I now keep on grassland. 
You know, so the, there is, the, we need a net figure, not a gross, yes, it's 30%. Yeah. That needs to be, to, be, to, to, be, to be reckoned for. Now the other question that raises, and I'm, a, I'm a, an absolute environmentalist myself, but there's, there are things about this debate in relation to agriculture that we need to be careful about, because we're thinking about the planet. I think there's now something close on 8 billion souls on the planet, and we don't produce enough food I know it's, the distribution is a problem, of course, to feed all of them. There's still a billion people who live on the verge of starvation on the planet. And there's probably another billion that are insecure. Mm -hmm. Now, by 2030, we might have moved up over 10, 12 billion people on the planet. And then we're not, we don't have enough land, we don't have enough clean water to produce food for all that, that kind of population. But that's where inevitably we're going, particularly in Asia. And I'm wondering now that this debate is moving food production away from intensification to an old term that used to be in the jargon to extensification. Maybe there's nothing wrong about it. But one day you might find as a result of the reduction of food on the, on the world, a climate incident in North America might wipe out half the food grain there or in Australia because these are the important places. Okay. And then you'd have starvation around okay. the world. Well, and, I mean, and I'd like that to be part of the consideration, this debate, which is okay. not. All right. Does anyone right. want to yeah. respond? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. a very, very so just, relevant and good I point. Just, uh, yeah. Sorry, Marion. Yeah. And, uh, and you are absolutely right to introduce the idea of food security. And if we look even at quite recent history, like the Arab Spring and whatever, a lot of those events were precipitated by spikes in the cost of, of commodities around the world. Literally, wheat, people did not have their daily bread. So it's, it's not just an impact on, on agriculture or on food, or that people might go hungry. It actually has implications way beyond that. So food security has to be part of this debate and of this argument. Uh, and I don't know enough about this, perhaps Thomas might be able to comment, but again, it's how we use the land we have, how we use the available resources we have, how we uh, look after our soils, because if we don't have much better soil management, we won't be able to continue to produce food like we do. We won't have clean water or proper nutrient abs absorption. So it, the question then becomes, how do we use the resources we have to feed the world? The way we are focusing on agriculture, is that the way we need to go? And just very quickly on your yeah. second comment of planting broadleaves, etc. I think what we need to look at in Ireland uh, is la integrated land use management. So that areas that, and you mentioned it earlier, Martin, that might be considered marginal, actually have very high value when it comes to carbon sequestration, etc. And then other areas are more suitable for whether it's dairy or beef production or whatever. But the problem is that we do not see both as equally valuable. The problem still is that intensive production, growing the, the, the numbers, etc., seems to be the objective, rather than trying to balance and have proper land use management that rewards all farmers for yeah. the goods they oh, produce. Okay, well, I, I, want to, I want to come back to the forestry issue in a moment because I know a lot of people are interested. Um, Pippa, you wanted to respond to, to John and, yeah. then, and then you, Thomas. Um, you mentioned about, I mean, initiatives such as agroforestry and actually integrating, you know, animal, you know, production with forests and with, with trees is important. One word that hasn't, I was glad to hear Marion mention um, soils, because what hasn't come up is biodiversity. And we tend to, what we, we end up getting caught up in these discussions. So today we're talking about climate change in agriculture. And then, you know, tomorrow there's going to be another talk about biodiversity in agriculture. We talk about these things in their own little pigeonholes when they're all part of the big thing. It's a holistic thing. Mm -hmm. And it's all connected, really, at the end of the day with food and food production. And that's connected with health and... and and human health on this whole planet. Now, we do produce enough food. We produce enough food currently for about 9 billion people. The problem, as you I alluded to, it's, it's, it's the distribution, it's war-torn, it's corruption, it's all of this issue. And what we do in terms of food security on a global base, we don't, we don't need to be producing like 
stacks of food here for other countries in one sense. We should be looking after ourselves first. I mean, we're food secure in beef and dairy, but we're not food secure in vegetables. We're, Ireland, I'm talking about. We're not food secure in potatoes. Um, we're not food secure in apples. I mean, we can grow fantastic apples. Potatoes, I mean, my goodness, we fed nine, eight million people with potatoes at one stage. So. Mm -hmm. We need to look at ourselves first, and that, that's how other countries should do it. So rather than importing vast quantities of grain from America <coughs> to feed you know, starving sub-Saharan Africans, we sh th the world together should be trying to help these people grow okay. their own food. And that's the problem, because that, there's no money okay. in big corporate um, agri food businesses if we get people to yeah. grow their own food. Okay, uh, Thomas, I'll let you back in in a moment. This, this, this lady here has been waiting some time. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hello, Mary Rooney is my name. I noticed that in the, the current focus on the divide up of the pie has started already on climate action money for farmers and there seems to be a massive focus on paying the polluter to improve but there's very little talk about payment for what Marion touched on there, the farmers in this end of the country who are very much farming the most valuable soil and land in the country for the first time, the most valuable in the world, the carbon rich soils. And I have a huge um, concern that that land is going to be forgotten again and that those farmers are going to be left assuming that they're going to continue protecting that land and that it's going to become part of their most uh, basic, the, getting their most basic payment to actually protect that land. When payments really and truly need to be flipped on their head so that, and paid on a scale so that the farmer who is not polluting gets paid first and gets insured a long-term payment that he won't have to be concerned about. So if you've got a farmer who's got these carbon-rich soils and has, uh, is looking after it and has always looked after it for free uh, by the way he farms, he should be insured that he will get paid to, to keep that. And other people should be paid accordingly to come up to that. And they should not be just paid to come out of being a polluter. Okay. Because we had a situation already in the last class where people who were polluters actually got paid 7000 mm -hmm. When there were people around here who were not polluters, who failed to actually get into the glass scheme at all because they weren't polluting in some way and there was no access to the scheme for them. And okay. they couldn't find an access to get that very vital 5000 at most a year. Mm -hmm. When okay. other people were given the opportunity to get seven. Okay, I'll get, the, I'll get the panel to, to respond to that in a moment. It's this, uh, this gentleman here. Yeah. Well, Kieran, yeah. as the Kieran. Chief Executive of Sligo County Council, yeah. Kieran Hayes. Kieran Hayes. Kieran. Just a, a few comments. Um, while I'm Chief Executive of the Council here, I also represent the local government sector at national level in terms of our response to the whole climate change challenge. And I will be the first to put my hand up and say we are not ready. Uh, we're not in a good position and it will take a serious amount of work for us to get into that good position. There is a lot of work underway uh, and we'll start to see it uh, evolve as, as we move on. Where we are very good is in responding and remediating after the uh, ever more frequent events of severe weather. Uh, and that's another element of climate change that doesn't really get the airing yeah. but it's where we are in the front line and actually very good in responding. Yet we have a serious amount of work to do uh, and part of that work is in the whole area of behavioural change. And taking the comments and the contributions from this evening, I have to say I was fascinated and interested by them, but it just shows the length that we have to go. It seems to me that the whole debate in relation to carbon tax is going to replace the space of the debate on water charges of previous years. Uh, we have the farming sector looking to the transport sector, and I'm sure the transport sector is going to be looking to the farming sector. And it seems to me we, we have, the issue that we have to face is to do the right thing. Yet we're all looking for the government to give us better subsidies to do this, that and the other. There will not be enough to go around. Uh, and I just think in terms of the challenge that we ourselves face, in the local government sector in the area of, um, I suppose, nudging along the behavioural change. I think, judging from tonight, I think we have a very serious challenge in that alone. Okay, well, that's a very stark warning from, from Kieran there. Uh, a couple of issues. Well, first, the, the access, what, what, what Mary was talking about, access to the glass scheme. 
Yeah, I think the access, yeah, to, the, the access to sorry, the, ahead, the, yeah. the access to the glass scheme was a problem the last time because many farmers that were in what would be considered, and I hate using the term marginal land, they were in farms of land that were in the west of Ireland that weren't as good a soil quality or as good a depth of soil, but they're still land that was farming and they were doing their business on it. But yeah. they couldn't show improvement. In other words, they were already farming the way that Gloss wanted them to farm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And when they went to look and said, Well, what can we do with you guys? Really, we can do nothing with you. You're already doing a perfect, so therefore you, you don't qualify. You get nothing. So you get nothing. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you get nothing for doing the right thing, and mm -hmm. the farmers that were able to show that they that yeah. they could do stuff did get into it. And, and I, th right. I think that that is the, is the nub of the issue here: the, the the low intensity grazing, which we see on the uplands generally, in this part of the world, is probably one of the most carbon neutral, if not actually sequestering carbon. Than, yeah. than, than anything else that can be used, the land can be used for. And one of the big problems we've got is that we have huge areas of that, what would be shallow bog or peat-like type land, which has been covered in silk spruce forestry, which is actually yeah. the reverse. It was doing yeah. better when it was left alone, okay. and now it's doing it's worse for the economy. Uh, uh, all right, and, and this is the problem with government environmental schemes. They're not results-based. Yeah. Th th those sort of farms should be getting paid now. You're doing it right. You, you know, yeah. you're, you're lucky if you're there. You've been, you know, marginalised for years. You've <coughs> hit the jackpot now. And the other farmers should be encouraged to get to that level, and then you get paid. It has to be results-based. Okay. You can't just make up the the, 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 the the scheme, tick all the boxes and say, there, that's job done. Okay, do, got, do, yeah. do you share Mary's frustration there, Thomas? Yes, and, and in that document that, that the Green candidate gentleman has there, it does say an agro-environmental scheme of up to 10,000 euros with priority, priority... <laughs> for the people with designated land, which is in this part of the country. We, we, we I know that, but, but it's still, there's an agri-environmental agri scheme. We're looking for an increased ANC. The current cap proposals does, is proposing for more convergence. What level that's going to happen? We only have, there's only going to be 1.2 billion. We have 140,000 farmers. There's not going to be enough to give everybody 20,000. You know, like, so it's about getting the balance right. We still have to support the farmers, the beef, fa the suckler farmers, the dairy farmers, the sheep farmers, the organic farmers. They have okay. to get funded as well. Do you know, like, All so right, okay. it's I, I, how it's divided out. Our biggest yeah. priority at the minute is protecting the money okay, coming I, I, from I, Europe I, I and want, making sure that I want to try and get come. to as many people no, as I can. I, but just I, I have to disagree. Okay. Our, our, not our biggest priority. One of our priorities is to protect and maximise the amount of money coming for the undercap. But we have other priorities that are just import as important. Where now the payments are based on stock numbers and on farming practices that were in place 20 years ago. Now, yes, we are having some convergence, etc., but there has to be a debate around that, Thomas. And yeah, I've and been that, to that too many meetings, there, I've been to too many meetings where people say, we'll get the ball of money from Brussels, and when yeah. we get it home, we'll see how it's divided. Okay. That's not the way to do okay, and, this. And, and, and finally, Pippa, you spoke about outputs and results-based. Yeah. The current cap is designed okay. to measure those, and, 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 and that's and, how people and, get and a, paid. And a, and a quick response from any of you in relation to what Kieran Hayes said about the prospect of the, the carbon tax becoming the new water charge issue. Martin is a politician. Uh, look, I, I, I don't think that's the case. I, I think really, you know, the opportunity that's there for to embrace this is where we need to be looking at it. I think inv investment, invest. Yeah. Everybody has yeah, well, posters up. Yeah. Uh, anyway, no, the election will be over in three weeks, Leslie. We'll see then. So, keep <laughs> <laughs> see <Okay>. then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no, no, Leslie, just let, just let him, yeah, okay, in relation to the carbon tax. Uh, keep going, Leslie, when you're finished, then I'll speak. Are you, are you finished? Are you, are you finished? Yeah, sorry, right. I'll, I'll come back to you, Leslie. Go, go ahead, Martin. Just, just finish, your, finish making your point, Martin, there. Okay, are you, you're finished now. Thank you. Um, no, the, 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 the issue in regard to, to where we're going to go with, with the, the carbon tax and all of that, yeah. I think the opportunity that's there for... And not just agriculture, but industry and every, every part of all of this, for to be able to reap an, uh, from an investment that goes in now. I think we need to okay. be seeing these as investments, okay. not as costs. And that's one all of the right. problems we've got, there, that there, governments say we have a cost of doing all of this. It's not a cost. It's an investment that will reap a okay, return, a, uh, not just for the environment, but economically as well into the future. There's, there's a couple of gentlemen who have been waiting there. So, yeah, down the back. Way down the back, yeah. How you doing? First of all, Maria Walsh is my name. I'm the European election candidate um, for Midlands Northwest, focusing on the west and northwest 
Um, will I step into the light? Are you good? No, no, no it's this light. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, first and foremost, I just want to congratulate the Institute for, uh, and, our, and our chair here, Niall, for uh, having a great conversation. Um, and I'm going to offer a little bit of transparency in the sense that Every day I'm learning more and more from all generations, particularly our younger ones, about climate. Um, and there's so much things out there uh, in terms of what we can be doing better and what we could be uh, doing more in a, in a prosperous way, in a balanced way, in a fair way. I guess my question to the panel is this. You know, I, I, went, I came away from a door uh, a couple of nights ago in Galway and a young man, father of two, says, why is in climate conversation treated with urgency? And I get it. I understand the impact and, and, and the noise he was making because it's much needed. But my problem is, at what point do we stop pointing fingers uh, and everybody sit around the table like the good old days and figure out solutions to making sure that proverb of we are not inheriting land from our, our parents, we're borrowing it from our future children. At what point do we say, hang on a second, what are we doing here to make things better in an urgent way? Now, I 100% agree, and I've been saying it to, in my entire campaign, it's the case of you can't flick a switch. Much like Agri, uh, both for the generation renewal programs, has to also impact climate. It's our transport, not just national, local, and European politics, it's also our international and everywhere in between, because it is an issue. And Greta is too mature beyond our years, and I wish we had a champion like her in this country, um, but I'm so delighted she's representing the European family. But I ask this to the panel, uh, and perhaps anybody on the floor, what is it that we need to start doing to stop pointing fingers at each and every one, uh, everybody across departments, parties, and say, hang on a second, let's all take responsibility to yeah. make sure in the next 50 years we have uh, our agri-sector growing, we have our younger generations not taken to the streets in droves, and we have a fair country. Okay, well, I, th I think we all agree there's less pointing fingers maybe than there has been, certainly politically, yeah. in the past. Does anybody want to respond to Maria? Well, I think, you know, the work that the Joint Committee have done, you've been a member of that, Martin, and I asked Thomas before we came up here, I said, what's the IFA's perspective on that? And he said, well, well apart from one or two things, he said, we'd be largely supportive of it. So yeah. I, I think that's the start of the dialogue, but as I said, it, it's up to... Uh, Perhaps, I don't know whether it'll be the department or whoever will coordinate it, but because of the fact that the Irish government, the Department of Agriculture, will have much greater flexibility now in designing programmes under CAP, designing different programmes for different parts of the country, uh, and working with farmers uh, to produce this strategic plan, which of course has to be approved by Brussels. You yeah. can't just come up with something. It has to be approved. But this, I think, if we use it properly, Maria, is a real opportunity to try and get people working together and I hear what Kathleen is saying and I've no doubt if I was a farmer myself I would feel a bit persecuted what more can I do I'd be saying um, but it, I think to get over that uh, we now have that opportunity and I think the the report that you have in the doll can be the starting point for that and is a good starting point and to bring people to find then ways, means, pathways for delivering yeah, delivery on okay. those uh, right. objectives I, I, that you have I, there. I go to this gentleman who's been waiting a long time. Apologies yeah, for that. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah. Trevor Bourne is my name. I'm a part-time farmer here in Sligo. I'm working in Sligo Town. Uh, the one thing I haven't heard mentioned so far from anybody, whether it be on the floor or on the panel, is uh, jobs. There's 300,000 people employed in the agri-food sector as primary producers in Ireland. And no matter what we do in terms of climate measures, and future climate measures, be it from Europe or the Irish government, we have to remember jobs and keeping people employed in this com country and keeping empl people employed in rural Ireland and in towns like Sligo, Ballymore, Tubbercurry. That's very important. Any measure that we bring in in terms of climate change to agriculture has to protect jobs that's, that's in agriculture at the moment. The other thing I want to, to stress there is, and I'll ask the panel, this is a direct question to the panel, how do we get the message out about what Irish agriculture is doing to protect our environment, protect our grassland, protect our countrysides, be it our hedgerows or watercourses or whatever it is. 
We export 90% of our beef product out of Ireland. Eating one less steak here in Ireland isn't going to solve the climate change issue. So my point is, jobs in Ireland, and how do we get the message out? We have 200,000 okay. carbon assessments done here in Ireland on Irish farms. That measurement isn't in any other sector. That measurement okay. is here in the agriculture sector. So we need to get the message out of what we have done in the sector and protect jobs in rural Ireland. Okay, all right. And I'll, uh, we'll, we'll take an answer to that, and then we'll take the gentleman behind you. Uh, Pippa, yeah, well, just, two um, points there. Briefly, on the first point you raised, is a very, very vital. And I was recently at a, a board Nimona event. I wasn't. It was about a just transition event. About the I live in County Offaly, so we're going to, you know, potentially lose, you know, hundreds of jobs in yeah. that one area when they stop harvesting peat. <clears throat> the, the same thing applies to the farming sector. If we're going to decarbonise agriculture, then we need a just transition approach to the agriculture sector as well. How we protect. That family farm, it's about protecting family farms and people who, who rely on it to survive. So I think it's comparable with the, the peat, you know, the, the fossil fuel sector in Ireland as well. I think in terms of um, getting out there, you know, you'd have to question, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, our biodiversity in Ireland is in decline. Our hedgerows are in decline. Our grassland is, and, and soil quality is in decline. So unfortunately, that message isn't there to sell. And I think if it were there, if we were improving those things in Ireland, that would be the best message to get out there. And okay. that would command 450 a kilo, at least, if not five. five okay. <laughs> uh, Thomas, do you think you're getting your message out and... Do you have a concern for in, in, uh, the possibility of loss of jobs? Yes, I do. And, and in June 2018, Chagas produced their climate report, which come up with, with 28 measures that had the potential to reduce agricultural emissions by a third, whilst yeah. maintaining our current numbers. In December, we wrote to Antishak Leo Vadia requesting that he coordinated a whole of government approach, delivery of this climate pathway, and this required policy decisions in, in Department of Housing and Planning, which I spoke about earlier on, Department of Energy, what Martin talked about for the, the people getting paid for producing renewable energy, the, the whole forestry thing, the calculating of emissions from the yeah. thing, the, the agroforestry, definitely we don't want conifers, we don't want uh, counties being taken over by, by Sitka Spruce, but there, there is a role for agroforestry going forward that is in that. We need the government to deliver this. We need to okay. deliver more in the renewable energy sector. We need it to, de to deliver in the energy efficiency sector. Yeah. There's, there needs to be more oh, support okay. for... I'll, I'll take this gentleman. Yes. Sorry, Just Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm a full-time dairy farmer since 1974. I also have a son at the moment that's a full-time dairy farmer. I make that comment because if I went to a, a meeting like this back when I started farming, 95% of the farmers would be full-time farmers and be five part-time. That has been totally reversed. And I think if we have to have a vibrant rural community, we have to have, and um, I've no doubt that carbon emissions and climate change, it's a huge challenge for dairy farmers, for farmers in general, and dairy farmers have got a lot, a lot, a lot of stick. But if we need young people in rural Ireland, it has to be economically sustainable for them. Yeah. And this event here tonight, uh, it's, a, it's a pity, like, that I see only a grey-haired brigade, and, and, I, and I classify myself. Is there any young full-time farmers? We have some excellent young time full-time farmers here, some of them in the West Ireland that have been young farmer of the year. Isn't it a great pity that we couldn't have some of them here tonight? Because they're the generation of people that's going to, 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 to have the future. And, you know, there's remarks there about differentiation of products. I was at the Ornona event the other day, and the most scanned uh, product in German supermarkets is Kerrygold butter. Yeah. The second most scanned one is Coca-Cola. So we can differentiate our, our, our product. And you know, the lady, the Pippa, mm -hmm. you, you said there about how, why aren't we growing more vegetables? And why aren't we growing more potatoes? The reason is because supermarkets commoditize them. They're giving them away. And the problem yeah. is that food is too cheap. You pass a filling station here in Sligo and you can get four litres of milk for 250. If you see anyone coming out of a filling station in the morning that these fan fancy coffee at 250, you don't hear anyone saying they're too, too expensive. Yeah. So look, yeah. we need full-time farmers here and we need young farmers here in the, in the West Ireland. Okay. And we need, uh, we, we need to have them represented and for, 
I see up there sharing ideas and shaping policy. And I think science can solve a lot of the problems. And in Paramus, the Department of Agriculture has done very little. Because I went to two conferences last year as regards, uh, and I went into workshops on, on, on climate. And there's a lot of things that can be done. Protected urea was one thing that can save emissions. Low ca uh, carbon spreading of slurry. Yeah. Genetics and science mm. can do an okay. awful lot. The lady there said that we can't, we can't actually pr produce more with less. If we've got the more efficient farmers in this country to come up to the standard of the top 10%, we could actually produce more dairy and beef with about 20 or 30% less, uh, less stock. So there is a lot to do, and we need full-time farmers to do it, and we need to keep farming alive here in the West Ireland. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks very much for that. I, I think, uh, Martin, that was kind of a point you were making earlier. I mean, yeah, yeah, it, it comes back to the point you were making earlier. as he says. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is, and, and to talk about, the Kerry Gold Butter is a typical example. You know, it was very well marketed. It was produced as a product that was identifiable across the world. We should be doing the same with our beef. We should be doing the same yeah. with our lamb. We should be doing the same with all of that. But the problem we've got, and the <laughs> gentleman down there put his finger on it, the supermarkets, the, 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 the market controls the system. Yeah. You know, and until we come up with a, with a way of, of, of wrestling that back. And really, you know, and to go back to Maria's point and the Climate Change Committee and what's been done there, and that, you know, politicians are starting to work together. And that's a good thing. And there, there is a document there while most things in it everyone agrees on, a few things people don't agree on. But in general, most people agree on most of us in it. But the yeah. problem we have is delivery, is making that happen. I mean, we have, uh, as you know, Niall, we have mm -hmm. a, a document about, about health care that come from a committee that we're supposed to have a slauncher care system and we're years yeah. and we still haven't delivered that. So, I mean, you know, it's really about the commitment. And okay. the commitment, and I'll go back to it again, has to come from government for to deliver. Okay. We, and that's we, not passing the book. We, we, that's, no, that's collectively. We've, it has got, to. we've got about five, five ten minutes left, maybe. Does anybody else wants to respond to that, that gentleman? Yes, uh, and, 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 and I totally agree with everything you're saying. And we do need a price for those measures that you mentioned, the prote protected urea and the low emission slurries, but they are in that Chagas report that I was talking about. We need a price for a product as well. We need retailer regulation. Yeah. We need a, a, a ombudsman, a retailer ombudsman, similar to what's in the UK. There's Christine Tagon in the okay. UK, where retailers can be held to account below cost selling and that a farmer gets a fair price for the product okay, as well. I'll, I'll let Seamus in in a moment. I, I just wanted to mention the, the forestry issue because I know there are some people in the audience with an interest in this. Um, certain farming reps have said in the past that um, it can restrict or control methane output, not by cutting the amount of cattle we have, but by creating forests to absorb or counteract emissions. Um, we have a real problem, as we know, particularly in County Leitrim. Um, what are the panel's views on that? You see, far, all forestry isn't the same. Yeah. This is the, and this, is the, this, is this question, this answer could go to all of these discussions. Everything isn't the same. You know, all beef isn't the same, all whatever. All forestry isn't the same. And if we grow trees for 25 years, chop them down and <coughs> burn them, that's a waste of time. You've, lo you've lost everything you've sequestered. It's back up in smoke. So y it's a type of forestry that we need mm. um, to grow, which is important, you know. Yeah, and it has yeah. to be a continuous cover model. It has to last forever, yeah. you know. And farmers maybe need extended payments to encourage them into that. At the moment, you only get the 15 yeah, years, 15 I think. Years, yeah. Yeah. You know, it used to be 20 or something. They used to front load it well, now right. to encourage people well, in. Well, I'll bring Marion in for you. Extend know, it you out. Know. Give it 30 years, 50 years, you, whatever you, it is. You're paying because you, you're sequestering yes, carbon you, on that you land. Know, and you're Marian, always paying for it. how much of a contentious this issue is at the moment in the region. You're absolutely right. You continue to sequester carbon when you have the broadleaves, etc. And I mean, it's look, it's like everything else. It's driven by money. Mm -hmm. I mean, the level of yes. grant aid and tax-free reliefs to people who want to plant forestry, no farmer can compete with them. So that if a piece of land comes up in Leitrim and somebody wants to expand, whether he's an organic farmer or a dairy farmer or whatever he is. He can't afford to buy yeah. it, or she can't afford to buy it. And this causes resentment and annoyance, and people see huge areas around where they live, where there used to be communities and schools being planted. And once that level of resentment starts, it's impossible to pull yeah. back from it. And it's because our forestry policy is not 
uh, holistic. It's not, it's, it's not looking for 30 and 40 years down the line. It's looking at now. Yeah. And, and that absolutely needs to change. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And, yeah. and uh, there, there's also, I mean, and let's be honest, I'm just saying what people say to me. There's resentment as well at this idea that farmers are coming from other parts of the country, either leasing or buying land, planting leitrim so that they can offset their own yeah. carbon mm -hmm. emissions. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's be honest about it. That's what the debate is out there. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. has to be stopped. All right. Yeah. Okay, Martin. I think, yeah, mm -hmm. I think one of, the, one of the, the key things in all of this is that it's, it's a forestry policy, but it's not really a forestry policy. It's a timber industry policy. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. about growing timber very fast yeah. for to make mass, maximum profits for a small sector of an industry, which is a very highly automated industry where very yeah. few people work. And the amount of grants that's there in place for it is feeding it, but also the fact that it's all tax-free. I mean, it's supposed to be that, that it's the second highest profitable sector after dairy. And I'd say it's probably the highest profitable sector because any money you make in forestry, tax-free. Make it on yeah. dairy, and you pay taxes on it. So, I mean, okay. it is a huge problem, and there needs to be a recognition of that. Well, one of, the, one of the suggestions that we had was that we should double the size of our hedgerows around the country. That we should let them grow out, and that we should allow farmers to plant additional trees along the hedgerows, and that they would get a payment for having those trees, yeah. okay. and that that would double uh, the carbon I'll sequestration I'll on every I'll farm. I'll let Thomas make a, a comment on that, and then I'll go to yeah, Seamus uh, in a second. Every, every farmer, regardless of what county they're in, they usually have a field that's not that suitable for farming, let it be hilly, let it be three-cornered or small or whatever. If there was incentives for planting broadleaf trees in those fields and, and get paid accordingly for it for whatever time, most farmers would take up that issue and it wouldn't have to be blanket afforestation of counties like Leitrim. That's un okay. I suppose, look, the department is conducting a study and hopefully it will... Uh, all right. Well, there's issues with that study as well. I mean, it's been, it's been, okay, it's been let's conducted let's by people who have been promoting Seamus that model May for in years. The, in the second row, Seamus. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the panel. And I'm glad to see, I think, is Maria Walsh still here? That's yeah. great. Okay, just a couple of uh, points, and I'd like to address them mainly to you, Thomas, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, we've heard a lot about the, the economic uh, crisis facing farmers. We've heard a lot about it tonight. And... My issue to this, I have huge concerns with the role of the IFA and the ongoing role of the IFA for many years. I did a report, uh, I gave it to Joe Healy in April of 2016, and it raised all of these issues that the beef plan are talking about, that the IFA are now belatedly talking about, and Joe Healy undertook to engage with me on all of these issues, but he binned the report. Now, the report, I, I do a lot of work in the area of corporate behaviour, business behaviour, business models. I don't know if you've seen the report. I, I think most of you in the IFA have seen the report at this stage. Now, I found that our industry over here is a, it's a wash with cartel behaviour. There's abuse of dominance, there's price fixing, there's market sharing. And I raise all these issues. And I'm going to tell you now why this abuse is going on. Because Marie Walsh's party, Fine Gael, are protecting okay. these cartels. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we, we and, don't want to get too particular about it. I want to move on to one, two more points. Yeah, and right. the, the other people that are protecting them, or have been protecting them <coughs> until now, is yourselves, uh, Thomas, in the, uh, in the IFA. But I want, to, I want to zero in now on the, the, on, on, on the environment, and I want to talk about the poultry, the poultry sector. The IFA know about the massive abuses that are taking place in the poultry sector. The nitrates abuses, the, the, the polluting of hundreds of miles of our rivers, the VAT fraud, and the abuse of antibiotics. And Thomas, I'd just like to ask you, why have the IFA been both the original report on the structures and behaviour of the sector, and why are the IFA covering up? Because if you don't become transparent, and you don't sit down and talk to all the stakeholders transparently, we're going nowhere. Okay. All right. Thomas, do you want to... Yeah, um, respond to some of Seamus's first of all, concerns. The, there are the, accusations. The issues, <laughs> the, the issues in, in the beef sector, um, I know there is issues in the beef sector. We have, we have commissioned Jim Power to do a full investigation into the beef sector to see what's wrong. Yeah, just, I know, just, I know, just look, look, and, 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 and there, has, there has been people, including myself, calling, there's issues with grading machines in factories, there's, there, there's problems there, we're getting, getting that. There, there is issues about uh, whether, what transparency we're getting, what factories are receiving for beef, quality assured beef versus non-quality assured. That's why we bring in Jim Power. That study will be published later on in the summer. We'll have to await and see. If 
anyone has evidence of a cartel, I didn't see a report. Um, but we, we, I'm sure if there is problems in it, Jim Power will take will, it on board. Okay. Will fi will find right. the problems. I, I'm, co I'm conscious so that we're just, a, just a, on, on, on IFA protecting. I, I don't, I don't know where you, you get the one that we are protecting the beef sector, on the poultry sector and, and the VAT allegations. It's a, it's a revenue issue, and I'm aware there is a legal case going on there between individuals and, and revenue and all the rest. So, I. I I don't think I should comment on no, that. No, I don't one. think you should. Okay. Yes. I'm conscious we're, we're, we're running over time, but when this gentleman here on the, yeah, on the right hand side. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is <coughs> Cormac Cairns. I work with Masonite in Carrick and Shannon. And, you know, backing up what Cairns said recently, um, it's very, very disappointing to see the polarization of, of issues here and, and, you know, people not coming to the middle ground. And disappointing again with Marion and, and, and uh, the polarizing forestry. Okay, so we. Our work in Leitrim, we support 140 jobs there. We contribute 8 million to the local economy in terms of wages and salaries alone. Um, we do admit that there were mistakes made in the past in terms of forestry. That was 20, 30 years ago when the forestry was very, very poorly developed in Ireland. We have plantations that are planted up to the side of the road. Uh, no mix of broadleaves, etc., etc. And a lot of that, those problems are coming home to roost now. Yes, that is a real problem. And that is a real problem that the industry has to face up to and to try and deal with. And uh, th there are things we are looking at. But if you look at uh, recent plantations in terms of the last 20 years, it requires a 15% broadleaf plantation. There are regulations around how close to the road that they should be planted. Um, the reality is that what we're encouraging is, is farmers to get involved in, in, in doing some forestry along with their agriculture. There's a sustainable in industry there. There are 12,000 people working in the country, it's a 2.3 billion um, uh, economy to work to Ireland. And in Leitrim, we manufacture doors. That's the value added product we make. We manufacture doors out of timber from Leitrim and we ship them all over the world. Now, maybe the shipment, we don't, uh, it's not good for our carbon footprint, but the, you know, we do recognize that there has been problems and specifically there has been problems in Leitrim, but I don't think this is an either or scenario. You know, Thomas, you talked about we don't want to blanket the country with silk and screws. Of course we don't. But we do want to get the percentage up to a point where yeah. it is a sustainable industry okay. uh, creating value out of products. All right. Okay. Thank Anybody you. want to respond to, to Cormac Just, and Marion? Um, look, I'm fully supportive of agroforestry. But that has not been promoted. That's the truth of it. That's not something that's promoted. And when you talk about 15% broadleaf, the target actually is 30%. That's what the European Commission laid down when they allowed Ireland to introduce state aid, because that's what we have. We have state aid for forestry <coughs> in this country. And the European Commission insisted on a 30% planting figure for broadleaf. We have not achieved it. So it's, it's not a, an either-or. I absolutely agree with you. But I'm just telling you what I hear on the ground and what people are saying. And it's because, and I agree with Martin, we don't have a forestry policy. And until we have one, people are going to be dissatisfied with what's happening. The other comment I want to make, as I might get in again, is, yeah. is to, to come back to what Seamus said. And he was talking about cartels and whatever. Yeah. Now, I, I don't know about cartels, but I know this much that when we talk about the beef industry and people not getting fair price, everybody points the finger at the supermarkets, and they're dead right to point the finger at the supermarkets, but we also have feedlots. We also have processors uh, in positions of controlling the market, because when you control 10% of the supply, you control the market. Yeah. That's the case in Ireland. So we need to be upfront about what the real problems are. They're not just one or two. There are a number of issues. And Seamus is right in regard to the, the VAT fraud in the poultry sector. I worked on that for several years. And it, okay. it, it is a revenue issue. You're right okay. about that. But again, it's not being dealt with. Well, it's partly okay. dealt with by I, I, revenue. I, I, but that's as far P as... Pippa going. and Martin to respond to, to Cormac. And we'll take one more question and, and well, then we'll I do, might we'll actually be responding oh, this sorry, way. But just, want, yeah. just to follow on from what Marion said. We have so, farmers, and I am one, we have so few routes to market. You know, we have a handful of meat processors. If you're a, a dairy producer, you have, yep. you know, they're, they're consolidating the creameries all the time. You know, back when I was a kid, there was a, there was a pig factory in my hometown. There was a creamery. Um, 
back in the day, there, were, there, were, there was local authority abattoirs. So there was plenty of choice there. People could bring their animal to the local abattoir, could go to the le local butcher. I mean, most butchers nowadays don't even have an abattoir out the back anymore. They're shutting down all the time. And again, it comes down to leadership from the top. Government policy is allowing that to happen. It's making it impossible for, for smaller um, local uh, processors of milk or food, or even, you know, vegetables yep. as well. That is not available now. And that's, that's the, that's the main problem. And you, one thing that hasn't been mentioned is Borbia. And one has to question, and Borbia is subsidized to the tune of something like 40 million a year of taxpayers' money. And really, what is it doing? Representing a handful of multinational, multi-billion euro turnover businesses. Yeah. It okay. is not representing Irish small okay. Okay. farmers Martin. at all. Martin, do you want to do? Yeah, just, I, I concur with that last point. But Board B is something I have a big chip on my shoulder about because for years we've been giving them money. And yet when we talk to the government about, you know, the price that the primary producer is getting, the farmer, he'll tell you, oh, no, that's got to do with us. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the market. Yeah. Well, yeah. the government is actually paying for the marketing, so it should be something got to do with us. But just to come back to the point that Cormac made around Masonite, and you know, the jobs are very welcome in Masonite. We've no issue with that. The problem that I have is that, and as you know, there's whole town lands in Leitrim that become covered in forestry. There's whole, like you're talking about one farm after another farm after another farm. And when that farm is planted, never again does it need a vet to come to look at a cow. Never again does it need a man to fix the tractor. Never again does the shed need to get a roof on it. Never again is there a bit of paint put in the gate. Never again is there a fence put up. It's walked away from and gone forever. And that's the problem that we've got. It's a permanent change of land use. And I would agree with Cormac. We would love to see every farmer planting a small portion of land. But the problem we've got is that it is mass afforestation that wipes out communities. Beside me in Ahavas, we have a three-teacher school, and next year is going to be a two-teacher school. That's not because of forestry. But forestry is part of the problem because we okay. have fewer people living on the land, living in the communities around us. And we need to regenerate rural land. And if we're going to do that, we have to do it together. And okay. we have to work together. All right. Okay. A, f a final question from N Natasha, and then, and then we'll do, do a quick wrap up. Natasha. Thank you very much. I'm um, from County Leitrim subsistence farmer, and I've been listening tonight, and I hear lots of talk of global markets and funding and prices we're going to get for beef, and I don't see at all any evidence that anybody's listened to Greta. We have, oh, are in the sixth mass extinction at the minute, if anybody realizes. We have 10 years in which to stop the whole society crumbling. And you're still talking about global business. The whole food system is completely flawed. We're talking about, here's the headline, climate change. This is uh, the biggest thing that's ever happened. Any world war, world war, any asteroid crashing into the earth, and you're talking about business. What we need in Ireland, and we are perfectly set to do, is local, resilient, subsistence farmers, providing food for local communities. You talk about the forestry. Yeah, it's great to have cells and doors, but what we're doing is putting carbon dioxide into the air. There'll be no future for our children to make doors. We've got to take this on the head and realize we're in a complete emergency. And forget about business. Capitalism is what's led us here. We've got to change from a capitalist system and we have to look at local, we have to look at Sligo, we've got great land, we can produce fruit, we can produce vegetables, we can produce milk, we can produce yoghurt, all the dairy products ourselves. Forget about getting money from abroad. That's, okay. We're not living in that world anymore. That world has got us to this point. We have to make a considerable change. And okay. I wondered whether any of you would um, admit to this climate change and it's see what uh, a disaster it is actually in the government because it's, from what I see, everybody's just pretending it's not the catastrophe that it really is. All right, is. well, well I'll, I'll work Natasha's comments into a wrap-up. Uh, she, she sees it as an emergency situation. We were hearing from Kieran Hayes who suggested we have a long way to go and, and, and um, Cormac talks about uh, polarisation. On a positive note to wrap up, Martin Kenny, are, are, we, are we getting there? Are we achieving what we want to achieve? Not yet. I, 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 think we're, I think we're still a long way from it. I think uh, until we get the... Uh, sort of the notion into people's heads that this is real, that it's going to happen. You know, and, and just to come back to the agriculture sector, you know, and I, I mentioned it to Pip earlier on, like years ago there was many different industries in agriculture in Ireland that folded overnight. And people had to switch. In. Like we had a huge linen industry in Ireland. 
and the next thing is cheap cotton came in from India at the turn of the century, and it just vanished. And, and, we're, and, and we're, yeah. we're, we're at, we're, we, we need to be able to, you know, change what we do fast, not slowly. And okay. the problem with farmers is, and, I, and I'm not being critical of farmers, but the problem with farmers, farmers are very traditional. They, are, they don't like to change what they've always done. They're risk avert. They do what they've always done because the way it was always done, I don't want to change it. We're now at a point, because of climate change, where land use policy will have to happen fast, where we will have to change, but I do think we can do it in a way that we have an opportunity, okay. that we can use biomass, uh, that we uh, can use biodigestion, bio that we can okay. use a whole range of things, including solar energy, all of those things, but it has to be done, a plan needs to be drawn up that we're going to make this happen in the next two to three years. That's okay. how quickly All I right. think we need to turn this around. How do you feel about it? Are you, are you positive about our, our <coughs> capabilities um, and, and desire to do something about it? Um, at the moment, I'm not particularly positive, no, within, within the agriculture sector. And we've, since this is about agriculture, we'll just focus on that. Uh, I think this, this, the changes that we're proposing are, are, it's too slow, it's too little, you know, it's too small, it's piecemeal. It's really not having any discernible effect on our own carbon emissions in, with it, you know, within the sector. So I think that's, that's very obvious. Um, I think you know, I can completely agree with that. I think we should be feeding ourselves first, you know, both sort of actually and metaphorically within Ireland. I think that's, that is something we should be focusing on. Um, and you know, instead of you know, feeding the world this sort of nonsense that we keep hearing, which is, which is a nonsense, we're not. We produce about less than one percent of the world's food, you know, in Ireland. So it's, we're not exactly feeding the world. Um, I, I, I just think um, I just. Yeah, well, I know, but that's yeah. not the world. That's that's thirty-five million people. That's half a percent. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. No, I'm not, I'm not, but we, we get told this is why it's so important to keep growing and keep producing more okay, and more. So we don't need to produce you're, you're more. You're not too encouraged, by the way. I think, I think we just need to focus on, okay. on producing better. All right. Better, less, but better. Th Thomas? Yeah, um, the Paris Climate Agreement said that sustainable food production must not be compromised in the climate debate. We are one of the most sustainable places in the world to produce food. We need, as, as Trevor Boland said, we need to get that message across better. Board B does need to do a better job marketing our green credentials uh, abroad. The fact that we're grass-based, we're sustainable, we have clean water, all our animals are outdoors for up to nine months of the year. Um, so, so we have to keep going that way. We are also, can, farmers can be part of the energy solution. We, can, mm. we need to be encouraged more renewables into the sector, let it be solar, let it be an anaerobic digestion and get more of energy efficient as well at the same time and maintain a vibrant rural co economy. Yeah, okay. That's Marion, what are your own thoughts? I suppose I'm, I'm conflicted. I'm listening to the subsistence farmer here and yeah. I listened earlier to the dairy farmer. And you both have lives to lead and you both have families probably and you want to find a way of life that works. And I, I don't think that we can sort of switch off the tap overnight and say we're not going to worry anymore about getting money from Europe. We live in a globalised world. We have to try and find solutions. And I think some good work is certainly being done at European level. I, I will agree it's not enough, but it's not nothing. It's quite substantial. And we can't just say we're going to close off from the world. We are part of the world and our responsibility is to, to try to shape European policy and, and hopefully that has an impact elsewhere so that we have sustainable food production. But it doesn't happen without significant change. I agree with you there. And, and I'm not sure that the determination uh, to have that change is there. And, and I think we need to hear more Greta Thunbergs. We need to be shocked to our core by listening to what's being said. And it's not us against them, and it's not farmers are to blame. As I said, over and back to Brussels, I'm as much to blame as anyone else. So we all have to look at how we live. But I don't think, I hear what you're saying about subsistence. I don't think we can just come back to that. Maybe in 20, 30 years time, that's the way the world will be. I, maybe that's how the world will be. But we in Ireland are part of a globalised system now. And what we have to try and do is make our production as sustainable as possible, lower our carbon emissions in a meaningful and real way, and make our contribution 
to a global effort. That's what okay. I, that's, I think, the best that we can do. But we do need to be frightened more, to change more, and to make it better. Okay, all right, thank you all. We, so we should leave, leave it there. If you'll pardon the pun, I think lots of food for thought uh, this evening. It has been very enlightening, I have to say, I think, for everybody concerned. And I think rest assured, lest anybody was any doubt, and I know we have, we have Maria, a European election candidate, and we have a couple of local election candidates, and you can rest assured, I think, this issue is uppermost in the minds of all those out campaigning uh, for the right reasons. Thanks to uh, the organisers, uh, thanks to our panel, to Marion and to Thomas and to Pippa and Martin. Um, I forgot to say Pippa is standing in the next general election as well as the local election in Lee Shoffley, isn't that right? Yes. So we may have two Open and maybe, maybe three TDs in future, we'll see. We never know. Thomas, you're not running as well, are you? Yes, no. <laughs> uh, thanks you all again for coming out. Uh, you know you're all busy and enjoy your uh, bank holiday weekend. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.